In the name of Jesus. The sermon text is the gospel as read with emphasis, come for everything is now ready. As Jesus sits down at table with the, deci- with the Pharisees, you can tell that already a dividing wall of hostility exists. It is there because Jesus sits with tax collectors and sinners and eats with them. He welcomes in the the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, but not so the Pharisees. There's a wall there, a division. They are the ones who keep the law. They are the ones who are faithful. They are the ones who are going to ensure that God will not visit his punishment against their nation again. But not so those people over there. There's a wall. Jesus, also sitting down with them, knows that this wall exists. For though he has been invited to eat with them, earlier in this chapter, it's noted that Jesus is sitting in a lowly place. If they knew who Jesus was, if that had been revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit does reveal this, but we may reject it, then they would have invited him to sit at the most honored of places. Instead, he sits towards the end. And he speaks with them about this, first addressing the way they chose to sit, and then addressing who they have invited. He notes to them that you should invite to your feasts those who cannot repay you, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. No longer let this dividing wall of hostility exist between you and your neighbor. It is in response to this, then, that one of these Pharisees says, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. On the surface, that's right, isn't it? Won't it be blessed when we eat bread in the kingdom of God and all mourning, all sorrow, all trial, all tribulation, all persecution is ended? But you know as well as I do that people don't always mean what they're saying. There's something underneath this. It's an indirect way of saying, hey guys, aren't we so great? (laughs) We, sitting here at this table, are the ones who will be blessed eating bread in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus tells this parable. It is to correct this misunderstanding about who will be welcomed in to this feast and how exactly you get there. First, who will be welcomed? The parable reads thus. There's a man who gave a banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I don't know about you, but if somebody offers me a free meal, I'm going to go. It doesn't matter what other things may happen to be going on that day. If Terry Wright says, come, I've got pulled pork and brisket for you, yes, I will be there. What is going on with these excuses? And who is it that's inviting them to the meal? First... This is God's invitation to his people, to the Israelites, first given to Abraham through you, 
Through your seed, all nations shall be blessed. Through the seed who is the Messiah, the seed who is Jesus Christ, the one who gives his life for, as a ransom for many. And those who are invited, all of the Israelites, including the Pharisees, but you notice there are excuses on why they can't come to the feast. First, one who says, I have a field to go and check out. Now, would you buy a business site unseen? Would you buy a field site unseen? Perhaps if you were in desperate need. But generally, no. This excuse is flimsy. It's a simple rejection of that invitation that God is offering, as if he has something that is better. Or perhaps it is this. We have our land, the land that was promised to us, and that is good enough. Is this life all that there is, dear Christian? No. God has prepared a better place for you. Though the world is calling out to you, come and eat, come and die. Reject that invitation. Hear the word of the Lord. The second excuse. I bought five yoke of oxen. I must go and examine them. Who purchases five yoke of oxen without having looked them over, checked them out, seen that they actually have teeth in their mouth and they're not just some decrepit old ox that can't pull, that can't do his work. And yet here, that's the excuse. And again, it is one that is flimsy. And yet perhaps there's more here. For it is the ox that is taken to be sacrificed for sins. And here again, then, the invitation to have a sacrifice for the sake of your sins. Jesus Christ, the one who propitiates God's wrath. Jesus Christ, the one who takes into himself your sins. Jesus Christ, the one who by his blood has brought you peace. Do not seek some other type of sacrifice through your life, through your works, through your money. It is insufficient. It will leave you wanting. The final excuse. I've gotten married. Oh, God be praised. Marriage is a good thing. Yes, it is a gift. But take your bride with you to the feast. I think she's invited too. You're one flesh. But here, we can see that it is something else that is calling. Looking at the gift of marriage and seeing it as more than just a gift, but the only thing. Instead of seeing the true relationship between you and your groom, Jesus Christ. This is the marital relationship that matters. This is the one flesh union that saves. But what's the point of all of these invitations and these rejections? You see, when Abraham received the promise that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. That means the promise is not just for him and his family. It is not just for his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, all of the nation of Israel through Jacob. It is for all people. That means you, you today. You see, that's why the message continues to go forth, calling all into the kingdom, calling all to receive. So you're the crippled, you're the blind, you're the lame. I don't know if I like being called that, though. Well, you already called yourself that this morning. As you confessed your sins, your struggles, 
Your blindness to God's mercy, your deafness to His word, your poorness. You need the riches of His righteousness. And that's why you've responded to this invitation to come. And dear fathers, as you sit there on this Father's Day, God be praised for you. Whether you are a biological father, these are the children that you have fathered, or you sit there as a spiritual father giving encouragement to your God children, or you sit there as a mentor to others within this congregation, you are giving the picture of our Father in heaven who says, come to the feast. Everything is ready. Everything is prepared. In other words, you're telling those around you, Christ has done it all. Everything that's necessary for your salvation, everything that was needed to redeem you, a lost and condemned creature, everything that is needed to sanctify you through the work of the Holy Spirit, fathers keep calling, come. Because our Father in heaven has not ceased to continue to call us to come, for everything is prepared, everything is ready. And that even means that the dividing wall of hostility between God and man has been torn down through Jesus Christ and his work. Now, mothers and children, that does not exclude you on this Father's Day. You too say, come. Because sometimes it's the, the child who says to mom and dad, please, read me a Bible story. And you read it. Come, Jesus is feeding you. Or perhaps it's the teenager who says, oh, let's walk down for that divine service on Thursday night or Sunday morning. And mom and dad say, yes. Let's do so. And sometimes it's mom sitting there at the table saying, please read me a psalm. And you say, yes, for Jesus is saying, come, everything is prepared, everything is ready. And he feeds you. Feeds you through that word takes down the wall of hostility, brings to you peace. There is a final thing to consider today, and that is that sometimes there are walls of hostility within your own life because of your own sin. Whether it's anger or bitterness or past hurts, that wall of hostility between you and your brothers and sisters, between you and your parents, between you and your fellow Christians, that has to come down too. How can we do so? Ah, that is where confession and absolution and the Lord's Supper come in. Confess your sin. Have them forgiven. Tear down that wall of hostility. See those around you as being loved and created and redeemed and sanctified by our triune God and therefore also worthy of your love. And then come here. For the feast is ready. Everything is prepared. It's done. It's finished. Come. Come and eat. For here is that blood which brings you peace. Here is that body which restores you. The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Here is that which brings true peace to you and announces peace unto the world that we're not divided, that there is not a wall of hostility either between God and us or between us. Us, you, me, one another. So come. Everything is ready. Everything is done. Come to the feast.
peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.